Mr. Eric Johnson. All right. Good evening. Um, question is, how many Clemson fans do we have in here tonight? There was a little bit of grieving, I understand, and um, I have to be honest with you, I'm a little grieved as well. Um, but I would like to know how many South Carolina fans are in here. You can leave. The door is right there, Chad. Eric, get out of here. I don't want you here anymore. <laughs> Congratulations, and um, may it never happen again. How many of you are watching the World Cup? Yeah. World Cup, USA, we pretty much beat England. When you draw against England, you win. I mean, that's just how it is. Is that correct? Exactly. So anyways, um, fun sports week, and uh, so glad uh, World Cup. I don't know if I know some of you like call it soccer football. I don't enter that disagreement or argument. I just love the fact to see the world come together to play a game, and it's just fun to watch, and it's been really cool. Well, Candace mentioned we uh, spent our week in Mexico, and we pretty much went from bed to another bed for four or five days. And this place had outdoor beds everywhere. So we woke up, slept all night, went and ate breakfast, and then we found another bed that was on the beach, and we just lay there all day. And it was, it was extraordinary. I, I've never done that before to this degree. I've, I've done, you know, laying on the beach, but it's so much work, but not this. Because you don't have to drive anywhere. They bring you food. They bring you drinks. You do nothing. And Candace and I, as she said, we are very adventurous, explorer-type people. Not this week. We wanted to do nothing, and so we laid there a lot. And I think we averaged, I mean, in a 24-hour period, would you say 12 to 15 hours laying down, Candace? A lot. I mean, it was a lot. And it was, it was, it was marvelous. I mean, I, I, I now know why all-inclusive resorts are such a big deal. And so, but there was something interesting happening. I found myself couple-watching. Some people do people-watching. I would do in couple-watching. And it was really entertaining to, uh, to spend four days laying down with sunglasses on because they can't see your eyes. And so my head would be this direction, but I'd be looking in this direction, and I'm just couple watching. And it was actually really cool because there's people literally from all over the world, a lot of Europeans, a lot of Eastern Europeans and Russians and just people from all over, specifically that part of the world. And I think most Americans were in, in, the, in America doing Turkey, and we didn't. We didn't want to do that this year. So I'm watching all these people this week, and it was really interesting to see what couples seemed to really be enjoying themselves. And there were other couples that were clearly not enjoying themselves. <laughs> and I was thinking, why would you fly across the world and put up in a resort like that and not enjoy each other? I mean, it just made no sense to me. My wife and I are thoroughly enjoying ourselves. And I just noticed there was a lot of dissonance between couples. But there were others, there was a lot of resonance that was happening. And so I spent my week, besides hanging out with Candace, just watching couples. And the last dinner we had in this one restaurant, I was so distracted by this couple next to us. They're young. I mean, it looked like they're just getting started out in their relationship. And I'm assuming they're married. I'm not sure of the dynamics. I didn't look at the rings or anything. But... The, the, the guy was clearly uninteresting. He was looking all over the room except for at his girl or wife across the table. And she, on the other hand, it was like you look at her and she is longing, like, give me some attention. And I thought, this is so sad. This is so sad of the dissonance that you can just feel all over the restaurant. So I was giving Candace play-by-play because play, her back was... <laughs> facing that table. I'm like, oh, honey, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Like, she got her phone out. She's like, I'm done. And she just started scrolling on her phone. And then I look back, and he got his phone out. And then they turned their phone sideways. And now they're watching videos and not talking at all. Life is interesting. It's, uh, it's an interesting experience of things that resonate and things that don't. I remember clearly, this was last year when we were driving across the country <laughs> We had left our entire life and world on the West Coast, and I don't know where it was, but it was somewhere in the middle of nowhere, driving a massive U-Haul, and Kenny Chesney came on. 
And I remember just being overwhelmed with all this emotion. I mean, I am just in tears of joy, of sadness, and all the emotion from one of Kenny Chesney's songs. And I'm like, wow, this is like, remember calling Candace. You need to listen to this song right now because she's in the other vehicle. And, you know, when I went through my breakdown, my crash, Lady Gaga made more sense than Maverick City. You see, there are things in life that resonate with you, and there are things that don't. For designers, I mean, we're, we're in the business of adding a design element, subtracting design elements. We're manipulating. We're, we're working with material, whether it's on a screen or in our hands. And, and it's, this, it's this moment that we get to where it's like, there it is. It resonates. It hits. It, like, it hits the spot. And then there are moments where where they don't resonate, and you're just like, I'm done, I'm sick and tired of this, and, you know, deadline to all designers are the bane of their existence. I mean, we hate deadlines. You know, for, for parents, there are moments where you feel like there's more dissonance with you and your child than there is resonance. And some of you might be in that space right now, like, there's nothing resonating between me and my child right now. And, but yet, you get to this moment, and every parent knows what it's like. There's this moment like, wow, it's resonating more now than it ever has. And you're like, finally. And then for some odd reason, your child decides to take on a different part of their personality. And logic and reason, and then you're back to square one because nothing resonating anymore. You see, life is a, it, it's a journey of the spectrum of what resonates and what doesn't resonate. This is our life. We experience it. Like right now, some of this is resonating with you, and some of it's like you're uninterested. This is just life with things that resonate and things that don't. Resonance and dissonance. Have you ever heard a song come on the radio, and it like it hits the spot? It just hits. And then you tell someone else to listen to it, and they have no clue. They're like, okay, that's great. Have you ever wondered why things resonate? It's like just all of a sudden, everything, the planets line up. Everything just seems to line up. Or you're reading a book. Have you ever read a book that resonates in one season? Like it, it answered everything to why you are alive. And then you read it a year later and you're like, this is the most boring book I've ever read. <laughs> you see, life is a journey of things that resonate and things that don't resonate. It's, it's these moments of convergence, these moments of where you're at emotionally, where you're at mentally, where you're at spiritually. One of the reasons why we don't finish a lot of books is they stop resonating with us. I have so many half-read books on my shelf. The first half was amazing, and then it's like, it, it's done. It ran its course. So we live in this world where we're constantly resonating with something, or something resonates with us, or there's just dissonance. Songwriters, writers, communicators, bloggers, your, your entire world is wrapped around words. Your whole, your whole world is wrapped around how do I put these words together? And, and you often come face to face with semantic satiation where that word doesn't make sense anymore. Like, is this even a word? Because you've looked at it way too much. You ever done that? You looked at the word mom too long and it makes no sense anymore? Like M-O-M, it's like, is that even a word? After a while, because you, this is what we struggle with. Things resonate. And we know there's words out there that we're, we just don't know. Our vocabulary is so limited, so we struggle. And see, this is what it's like to be human is we go through the journey of what resonates and what doesn't resonate. This is what it means to be human. And the challenge is we, we spend our time trying to make the world resonate with us. We spend our life, when nothing resonates, we try to control the world outside of us to get it to resonate with, with what's in us. And so we, whether it's a person, if that person's not resonating with me, my option is to control you, to get you to resonate with me. And so we spend our life trying to make the external world line up with our internal world. We try to make the external reality, dynamic, people, situation, you fill in the blank, and we try to manipulate, control, suggest, exhort, plead, beg to change so you can resonate with what's going on here. And this is the journey of life, is trying to create a world out here to match the world in you. 
And this is one of the great challenges that we face. And along with resonation and dissonance is, comes something called emotions. When something is not resonating with you, it's a really interesting if you pay attention to your emotions. Some of you are really connected to your emotions and others of you don't. You just stuff them. You ignore them. Emotions are for the weak. And that's really a, a very inferior way to look at how God actually created you. I believe you and I were designed to experience every emotion known to man. You were designed for that. Whether you want it or not, you don't actually have a choice. It will affect you. But yet we spend our time trying to reduce our emotions to only positive ones, to only fun ones, to ones that we like, to ones that make me feel better. And so we control and we control. All we're actually doing is reducing ourselves down to a very small reality. You may think you're king of the world. No, you're the king of a microcosm of what it means to be human. And that's what our attempt is to get everything out here to resonate with what's in here. And the size of you will always determine the size of the world you try to control. So the question is, are we going to let dissonance in our life shrink us? Are we going to let the things outside of us, the things that are beyond us, make us smaller? Or maybe, maybe what if we did something different? What if we actually let those things, let it become, grow, and to expand who we are as a human? And this is challenging because right now in this day and age, there's such an uptick of dissonance in culture. Some of you are walking around this earth right now going, nothing resonates with me at all. And if you, if you marry yourself to that ideal, you will find yourself living on a thousand acres with no other human in sight. If you continue down that logic, and perhaps that's the best for you for a moment, for a season. But I would propose to you, you actually weren't designed to do that. You weren't designed to live a life at the mercy of the dissonance outside of you. You were designed to do something else. And I actually believe Jesus actually introduces a way of living that teaches us how to resonate in a world that has so much dissonance. So today I want to talk a little bit about that. In modern culture, there are two key words in modern culture, feelings and self. I don't know if you've noticed, but you will now, now that we're talking about it, I want you to pay attention to what you say and the people around you say. You'll notice when you start asking how people are doing, or if they're trying to make a major life decision, or life decisions are just happening, in modern day, it's very common to say, well, I feel like X. I don't want to do this because it doesn't make me happy. And so now we have a vernacular that is reinforced by a modern ideology, and that is, if it doesn't make me happy, if it doesn't serve me, then I'm not doing it. So again, we're shrinking ourselves down to a world that we can control. But yet you are designed to be in a world of craziness and confusion and be fully alive. I know this is hard for some of us to actually believe this. Could be like, this is impossible. It's actually not impossible. What's interesting about the life of Jesus, they came to Jesus and said, hey, if someone slaps me upside the cheek, what do I do? And Jesus said, turn your other cheek. What they were wanting to know is, do we get rid of the slapper? <laughs> do we get rid of the person or do we remove ourselves from the environment that creates the slapping? And Jesus said, I don't know about that, but you should at least turn your other cheek. What is he doing? He's introducing a reality that your inner world can actually be larger than the circumstance you're experiencing. That what's going on in you can actually be more powerful, not in an overbearing sense, but in a, this does not actually change who I am. The problem is we're letting all the slapping in life determine who we are. So Jesus goes on, he, make, he brings up a whole nother, hey, if the oppressor comes to you and makes you carry his backpack for a mile 
And in Roman custom, if you were a soldier, you had the legal right to find any citizen and say, I need you to carry my pack for a mile. And you as a citizen or an occupant in Roman territory had no other choice than to stop what you were doing, put down your stuff, stop your job, stop whatever you are doing in that moment, put on the oppressor's backpack and walk a mile. This was custom, this was law, this was written into the code of Roman culture. And Jesus said, hey, when that happens, when that oppressor comes to you, this is what you're going to do. Offer two mile, not just one. So Jesus, now this, it might imply that he said we shouldn't remove slappers and oppressors. That's a whole nother conversation that I don't even want to entertain today. All I want to get at today is this, is that Jesus actually doesn't teach them how to get rid of slappers and oppressors. He's teaching them something much greater. He's teaching them, you can actually enter into the dimension that I live in. And if there was any person, any person that needed a reprieve, a break, a vacation from dissonance, it was Jesus. It was Jesus 100% hands down. That guy deserved a break from all the dissonance and culture because everything would eventually aim towards him. And here Jesus walking around the Middle East in the first century, almost unfazed. But what's interesting is Jesus is not unemotional. He's not I don't care. He deeply cares. There's moments in his life where he begins to weep over Jerusalem. He begins to weep because someone died. He begins to, to we, here we see that Jesus is experiencing all the emotions known to man. But yet he never came underneath or he never tried to control the world outside of him to match the world that was in him. I don't know about you, but that's inspiring. I, and if you're, if you're in this room and you're not even a Jesus follower or you're nominal or you don't even know if God's the real thing, at minimum, look at the life of Jesus. And I guarantee you, you'll be like, well, at least I would like to live that way. Well, I can live my life. And when this happens, it actually doesn't affect me. It doesn't mean I don't have an emotion. It doesn't mean I have an opinion. It just means I will not become a slave to this situation. I don't know about you, but that is inspiring, and I aspire to that. Some of you are sitting by someone that is farther along in that journey than you. And some of you are sitting by someone that maybe are not that far along in that journey. They just react to everything in life. So today, I actually want to talk about, so how do we, how do we find ourselves to move along this pathway where it's no longer trying to get everything to resonate with us. We actually are resonating with a different world. The only answer to that is you resonate with how Jesus functioned, enter into his dimension. This is way too simplified, but start studying the life of Jesus. We don't have, any, we don't have a lot of time today to go over all of it because that would take the rest of our life to thoroughly be able to do that. But today I want to, I want to, I want to share some thoughts around this idea of how do we, how do we get along in this life where we did where we experience all these emotions. I believe every emotion we encounter is another opportunity for Jesus to disciple you. I believe every emotion. There's an interesting article I read, and I'm going to read an excerpt to you. It said, so this is the beginning of the excerpt. The field of positive psychology has at times been criticized for failing to acknowledge the value of negative emotions. Barbara Held of Bedouin College in Maine, for example, contend that positive psychology had been too negative about negativity and too positive about positivity. To deny that life had its share of disappointment, frustration, losses, hurts, and setback, and sadness would be unrealistic and untenable. Life is suffering. No amount of positive thinking exercises will change this truth. So telling people simply to buck up Count their blessings and remember how much they still have to be grateful for, for can certainly do much harm. Processing a life experience through a grateful lens does not mean denying negativity. It is not a form of superficial happyology. Instead, it means realizing the power you have to transform an obstacle into an opportunity. It means reframing a loss into a potential gain. 
recasting negativity into positive channels for gratitude. The human soul is a thermometer and it's a thermostat. The human soul, the soul that lives in you, has the ability to tell you the temperature and it has the ability to set the temperature. That's the intelligence of the soul. Like some of you walk into an environment and all of a sudden your soul is telling you something's off. Something doesn't add up. This field and you fill in the blank. But it's amazing when you're able to understand that that actually doesn't determine who you are or how you should feel. When you can recognize that you're also a thermostat, guess what? Your same soul that tells you the temperature can actually set the temperature. Are you guys with me this evening? The same soul that tells you it's dark in here. It's cold, it, there's a bunch of pride, there's a bunch of fear, there's a bunch of anxiety. That same soul that tells you that can also say, but this is what we're going to do. Yeah. We're not going to live in that temperature in those degrees. We're actually going to set the temperature in the degrees. This is why Jesus would walk into every situation of sickness, disease, lack, and need, and want. And he changed the temperature of every situation. This is what you and I are aspiring to be. Some of you work in world and dimensions of society that I will never, ever touch or see, at least at this point in my life. But you're in that world. You're in that environment. And guess what? Your soul is telling you it's got this is the problem. Guess what? That same soul with the Holy Spirit has arrested the same soul, has the ability to change the temperature and the climate of all those situations. Some of you are in jobs right now, you can't stand, you despise because it's got so much fear, it's so toxic, guess what? You can actually change the temperature. So let's ask the question, how do you actually change the temperature? You have to learn to become resilient to be able to navigate the spectrum of dissonance and resonance. But let's back up. How do you become resilient? Because just telling you to be resilient worked for about a week. How many have ever had that experience? You get counseling saying, you know what, you just need to suck it up and just power through this. You're all inspired. You gave them a $500 check for that advice. And you go back out into the world, and a week later, you are just dying. So just telling someone to be resilient actually doesn't always work. In my opinion, there's a few other steps before becoming resilient. The first one has to do with being content. Now, the challenge with that phrase, some of you said, oh, I just settle. No, it's not settling. It's actually settling for the highest level of settling, even humanly possible. If you'll turn your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 4, I want to read a couple verses to you and unpack this, and then we'll move on to the next thing. And as you're turning there, Jesus seemed less concerned about getting rid of things in life that was causing dissonance and creating pathways to come into the dimension he was living in. And in Philippians, Paul, it's actually a really fun book. I love Philippians because it's, it's the most unstructured letter that Paul wrote. It felt like he was writing to a friend. He loved the Philippian church. He loved them dearly. And you can read it as you're reading this letter. There's structure, but it's less formal. It's like talking to someone really close versus talking to someone you barely know. And in Philippians chapter 4, let's read in verse 12 and 13, it says this. In any and all circumstances, say that with me. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Now that last verse is very well known. Whether you're a Christian or not, I can do all things to Jesus who strengthens me. Every professional athlete says this, every CEO says this, and every mom and dad of a toddler says this. We use that verse is the insert it wherever you want in life. Wherever you're hitting resistance, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the one verse, that universal verse that we all love to use. But, and that's okay. I'm not against that. But I want to just take a moment and, and make it a little bit more, make sense of it a little bit more. In order to understand these two verses, let's go to the above verses, chapter, verse 4 through 7 of the same chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. 
but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse, these three verses deserve an entire month to just unpack. But I want to draw your attention to Paul saying, I have learned the secret of being content. And in the previous verses, he lays out, these are actually things that I do to be content. But let's talk about the word contempt. Right now, if I gave Josh, if I pulled Josh up here, and I gave him $500 cash, Josh would be pretty excited. He'd be pretty, I don't know how he'd respond, but at the end of the day, he'd be pretty encouraged. He would be thankful because of what I have done for him, of what I have given him. So there is a dimension of being content that is the result of something. Most of us in this room can recall a moment where God did something in your life. He provided for you, or he ministered to you, or he sent someone your way, or there was a breakthrough. I mean, we all, most of us have stories where, man, when God did this. And because of that memory, that moment, we are content. We can be content and like, you know, because God did that for me, I'm content. So that, that base level of contentment. There's actually a higher level of contentment that goes beyond the result of something. And when you unpack this passage and this verse, Paul is actually introducing something. Now, in the behind the scenes of this text, there's actually a group of people alive during Paul's era called Stoicism. And it was a group of people that had an ideology, a belief system, that your goal is to repress your emotion and to be stoic and it was your way of being self-sustainable through all the experiences of the human experience. So the Stoicism, the idea of like, I can do this. I can actually self-sustain. I don't need anybody's help. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to ignore all the emotions that caused me to do this. And I'm going to become flat. And in this, I am then able to navigate all of life. And Paul is taking this concept that was alive and well during his era, and he's saying, okay, we're not content like that. We're content because of something else. We're content because Jesus exists. Let me say this again. It's not because what Jesus has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. He's saying, I am content because he exists. Imagine that that's all that you need to be content in life. Instead of going from miracle to miracle, from breakthrough to breakthrough, from moment to great moment, instead of having to wait for that next thing to happen to help you feel better, imagine not having to live in that roller coaster of dissonance and resonance. And you actually enter into a dimension where like, I am content simply because Jesus exists. And when he does something for me, that is just a cherry on the top. That is the bonus. That is the extra. But imagine, this has been my goal for at least a decade, not to become unemotional. And to be honest with you, I've gotten more emotional in the last 10 years of my life. Ask my wife. <laughs> I have become way more descriptive of what's going on in my soul. So this whole idea of being content in Christ isn't oppressing my emotions of life experiences. In a way, it's become more, but my contentment is becoming more and more lined up with the fact that Jesus exists. It's because he exists, I give thanks. It's being content. The second thing, if you'll turn your Bible to Psalms 100, we'll do a few more minutes here. Psalms 100, verse 1. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Look at verse 4. Enter into his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Now, some of you are familiar with this verse, and some of you read this, and it feels a little flat. It feels a little, what the big deal? The problem is courts is a foreign concept to us. The whole idea of coming into God's court was very much an Old Testament reality. In order to approach God, you had to walk into a defined space, whether it was the tent, whether it was the temple, 
or a place of meeting that God established in the natural and in the physical. You had to enter in to encounter the presence of God. That's a foreign concept to us on this side of the cross because it's no longer about a location or a destination. It's about you. You have now become the temple which God resides. So when we read this verse, we're like, I I don't need, where's the court? Is it a basketball court? Is it a pickleball court? There's no physical court anymore. But the concept is this. In order for me to come into the presence of God, no matter what is happening in my life, I will enter it with thanksgiving and praise. I'm having the worst day of my life, the worst year of my life, but I will continue to choose to be thankful. Why? Because I won't let self determine self. I will let thankfulness and gratitude and gratefulness define self. I will let that define who I am. And they've actually been doing a bit of scientific study. They're saying the more grateful for you are, it actually activates the frontal cortex, which helps you with decision making. How many have ever made a good decision when in a really bad mood? (laughs) Not one person. How many of you actually have made a great decision making process in life when you're stressed? When you have anxiety, when you have fear? No one. So when you choose to be thankful, you're actually redefining yourself in this moment. And they're actually learning now that it actually creates, a, your brain is now able to enter into a space where you can make good decisions. For some of you, your key to making good decisions in life is to up your gratefulness and to up your thankfulness. So being grateful and being thankful activates a part of you that you need to even function in this world. So I will enter into its court with thanksgiving and praise. Gratefulness creates momentum. What's interesting too, they're learning that when you become grateful, chemicals are released in your brain. The kind of chemicals that are pleasure, dopamine. They're like, ooh, I like what happens when I'm grateful, when I'm thankful. And guess what? All of a sudden, neural pathways are created like, I'm going to do that again because last time I did that, this is what happened. It's amazing how easy it is to entertain fear and how hard it is to entertain thankfulness. It's an amazing moment when you're able to enter into a space of thankfulness and gratefulness in the worst moment of your life. When you're experiencing tragedy and loss or when there's so much dissonance happening, you're able to say, you know what, God, I'm so thankful that you exist. I'm thankful for who you are. I'm thankful that I'm alive right now. I don't like anything about my life, but I'm thankful that you are alive. And all of a sudden, your brain, your physical body, your spirit, your mind, your emotion begin to get defined by who you're being thankful for instead of yourself defining yourself. This, being content and being grateful, leads you to a place to be resilient. Today, resilience is a, is a lost art. It's such a lost art. It's amazing. Like, we, we hit a bad week and we quit. We, we hit a bad moment and we wonder if we have any purpose in life. We, we, hit a bad, we hit a bad season and we just question everything in existence. We, we, we go back the entire life, duration of our life, and we wonder what we did wrong. Instead of just saying, there's resistance, what if I learn to be content? And what if I learn to be thankful? And I develop resilience to continue to move through life. I actually was expecting a little better response than that, but that's okay. That, that is my problem. I set an expectation, and I tried to control you to meet what was happening in here? And I, I apologize. I, uh, I want to be vulnerable right now and just. Being resilient is necessary virtue to learn as a human being. Pain is your friend. Look at your neighbor and say, pain is your friend. If I fall off the stage and break my ankle... If I fall off the stage and break my ankle and my body does not tell me it's broken, we have a serious issue. Resilience is what's needed to understand how to live life where there's dissonance happening. 
I know we just finished Thanksgiving. This might have been more fitting last week, but it makes so much more sense now. Becoming resilient isn't just about bouncing back. I fall and I get up. That, that's a part of it. I mean, that, that's the dimension of it. It actually means to get stronger. It actually means the ability to get stronger, not just to bounce back. Not just to get back, I'm, okay, I'm breathing, I'm alive, okay, I didn't kill me. No, it actually means that to be resilient, to get up, and I'm going to take whatever this is and utilize it in a way to become a better, stronger person. I laugh at my 20s. I thought I was, I thought life was so hard in my 20s. I know all of us live life, like when you look back, you're like, I thought in high school I was so busy. I knew nothing of being busy. Some of you look back in college, and you're like, man, I remember in college stressed out about, do I have time to do everything the college wants me to do, my homework? And now you're like, that was so easy. All I had to think about was myself. Now I've got to think about other humans and other people and other situations. Do I have to understand you? God designed you to become resilient, to navigate life. But some of us are, are ejecting these opportunities to become resilient. Some of you are in moments right now where you feel like quitting because you had a bad day at the office, or you had a bad quarter in your business, or you had a bad week with your child, or you can't seem to create anything anymore. Being resilient is the thing that God's actually trying to build in you. So on that note, learning to be content because he exists, and learning to be thankful and grateful at all times will create a level of resilience in you that will actually blow you away. So why don't you stand? <clears throat> I'm going to pray. And I want to ask everybody's eyes to be closed. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to give an opportunity for people in this room. Father, we thank you for what's taking, taking place in this moment. And I pray that every person, whatever they heard today, they ultimately would hear your calling, your summoning to become a resilient person, to become a person that doesn't let the dissonance, the confusion, the chaos of life determine us. But we learn to be resilient, and much like Jesus was resilient in everything. So I pray for every person in this room, this virtue, would become a passion of ours, that we would encourage each other, hey, get back up and get stronger. Not because it's cliche and not because every motivational preacher talks about it. It's because it's actually the world that Jesus lived within. And so I pray that the kingdom, the dimension that Jesus was introducing would become more of the world that we live in. I want to give an opportunity for people in this room. If you don't know Jesus, and you find yourself in this room. You've never given your life to Jesus. Or perhaps you've walked away from him. At one point, maybe because the church hurt. Or just life happened. And you just walked away from Jesus. And today you want to make it right. Whether you want to come to him for the first time. And surrender your entire existence of who you are. To King Jesus. Who died on the cross so that you could be without sin. Be without blemish. If that's you, I want you to put your hand up. And when you put your hand up, what you're saying is, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender my entire life to him. If I don't see you, just wave at me. I'm looking around the whole room right now. Is there anybody here that you need to get right with God? You've, in a way, kind of gotten off track. Or you've gone the other direction. And today you recognize, I need to, I need to re-up my commitment I need to make another commitment to him for the rest of my life. If that's you, I want you to put your hand up. Put it up high so I can see you. I'm looking around the whole room. Okay. Well, with that, I bless every home. I bless every person. And I bless that this week will be a week of becoming more resilient than last week. That we will be some of the most grateful, thankful people in South Carolina. And so everybody said... Amen. Amen.
Before you're dismissed, if I could have our leadership team or any of our studio home pastors, if you guys could make your way over to that far wall over there. If you're in this room this evening and you need someone to pray with you about anything in your life, as soon as we're done here, you can make your way over there and our team would love to pray with you. And don't forget on your way out, we have a couple amazing opportunities to do Christmas generosity with the mission and the local food bank. Bless you guys. Have a great week.